A new life. Hello, this is Voices of the Festival. Again, I'm uh, calling from Tokyo and this is Tokyo. You can see the evening here uh, a bit. It's 11 p.m. here and uh, I started one, but, but we had trouble connecting. Um, so I had to call. I actually Marquita called me and I think we should be now. And I know Benjamin was watching and some other people. So here we are and trying to... Marquita. Um, and hopefully she's watching. There we go. And I invite her and she should be in. Um, it's always a little complicated to get started. Uh, there we go. Hi. 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 Hey, yo. Hey, Hi. Up? Yes. Eventually, eventually it does. It's, it's always a little awkward at the beginning uh, with, with everyone because sometimes, you know, <laughs> I had to always invite people and, um, so, but um, now we are connected. How are you doing? I'm doing well. What about you? Why are you in Japan? I'm in Japan here. I will show you a bit of the, the night here. Uh, I'm in Japan because I'm, um, I'm the artistic director of, uh, of a festival here. It's a workshop called Tokyo International Vocal Arts Academy. And I do a summer workshop here every every summer, uh, for two weeks, and we just had a performance today, and we have another one tomorrow, and then I fly to Savannah to start the, the Savannah Voice Festival, so um, here, it's it's a great, you know, it's, it's great fun to work with singers here in, in Tokyo, and I've, we've been doing it for eight years, this is our eighth uh, installment, so quite a bit of, of, of time. Unfortunately, the last two years we were had we had to do it online because sure. it was not possible to travel but we are lucky to be here in Tokyo even if it's for a short time yeah, we are here only for two weeks um, yeah. I mean actually I was only here for a week because I was in in Iowa doing um, the voice experience so but really fun to be in Tokyo have you been to Tokyo yes I've been there several times it's a wonderful city Excellent. it really is fascinating it is fascinating, indeed. And where are you right now? I'm in Washington, D.C. That's where I live. Great, great. Are you originally from Washington? Born and raised, a true Washingtonian. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> you know, the, the, it's one of those cities that usually people are not born in, like New right. York. And when you run into someone that is, is from New York, I say, oh, that's unusual. Yeah. Uh, I pretty much, I'm sure it's the same thing with, with, with Washington. A lot of people move to Washington, mm -hmm. but not so many are born and raised. So how was, uh, how was uh, growing up in Washington? Well, you know, it's a really wonderful city in the sense we have so many Smithsonian's. You know, with, there's so much culture here with opera and theater. And so it's, um, it was a great place to grow up because there was always something to do, somewhere to go. And even though my parents, um, they were on opposite scenes of the spectrum, my mother really loved classical music and my father really loved jazz. My mom would take me to New York also to see different things. And my father and I would go to different things right here in Washington, D.C. So it was, it was it's a wonderful experience growing up here. Did you, did you grab musical for, for both parents? Meaning did you grab what? listening to, to classical music and jazz from yes, the beginning? Yes, absolutely, from the beginning. And of course, gospel, because I grew up in a missionary Baptist church. And so mm. anybody who grows up in the black church, you know, it's a really rich experience in regard to gospel music. You know, it's, it's, it was for me the foundation of understanding performance, because in the right. church setting, you know, everything you do, the church is supportive of, no matter how great it is or how how simple it is. There's that support system that breeds confidence. That's fantastic. So did you go, did you start performing in church since very young age? Well, in this household, you had to. You had to sing in church. That started as soon as you could talk. So, wow. <laughs> yes, in regard to my grandmother and my you know, we were the, the whole family thing of going to church. And so you had to participate. There was just no, no question about that. And I'm glad about that, actually, because it gave me 
such a very rich experience from an early age. And, uh, and when did you decide to study music? Well, you know, that's kind of a long story. My mother, do you remember, they used to have the voices of Firestone that used to come on television. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and also the Texaco broadcast that would come on the radio every Saturday. And my mom um, would play the Texaco broadcast every Saturday. And I heard on the broadcast, Leontine Price and Martina Arroyo. And so when I heard them singing, I remember being very, just very, um, I don't want to say grabbed, but just it, it was, it stopped me to hear their voices because I had never heard voices quite like that before. And I asked my mother who they were and she told me who they were and she asked me, did I like it? And I said, yes, I love it. And I said, I can do that. And my mother, of course, my mother's a teacher. And she said, well, of course, darling, you can do anything you put your mind to. <laughs> but I don't think that she really thought that I was very serious about it and wanted to pursue it. So right. when I was in elementary school, I participated in all the little musicals and all the little concerts that we would do. And mm -hmm. my mother was making costumes and putting aluminum foil on shoes and, and all of that to create the characters. And so by the time I got to junior high school, it was my choral teacher there who told my mother she thought I really had a talent and that I should start taking some formal lessons. So by the age of 14, I started taking voice lessons and, and competing in gnats and, and doing those kinds of things. So, and it was wonderful for my mother because my mother, she then became the ultimate stage mom and <laughs> made sure that I was a part of everything. Yeah. Great. So, so, so your mom was taking you to competitions and- Exactly. Uh, and and performances. Uh, what was your, your, your first memorable performance of an opera? Well, my mother took me to see Porgy and Bess when I was in high school, when it came to the, to the Kennedy Center. When they, um, with, it was with Clama Dale and Donnie Ray Albert and that whole crew. And I remember it being very memorable. Of course, at that age, you don't fully grasp the story. And little did I know that I would be performing Porgy and Bess when I became an adult. And so I just remember it being very, to me, it was very riveting. You know, just the whole thing that was going on stage, I was fascinated by how big the production was. But I also, I really loved Kalama Dale. You know, I thought that she was very exciting. I thought that she threw herself into it. And once again, I never knew that later on in my life I would actually meet her and replace her in a performance because she became very ill. So okay. it was interesting how that whole, that whole thing started for me. You know, um, when I was in school, I went to Oklahoma City University for graduate school and, and um, New England Conservatory for undergraduate school. And it was, it was John Moriarty who really started to shape me in regard to being an opera singer and being a singer, period, because of his thing about diction, his thing about, you know, being very wed to the, to the performer and the text and the character, you know, who it is that you are portraying at that time. And um, then going to graduate school. And, you know, it was funny because I went to the Met auditions. To, I went to the National Semi auditions very young. I was 21 years old. But it was there where Risa Stevens said to me, you know, you're very young, so you need to get into a program that is going to really help you to finish your technique and shape you to be the kind of performer that you want to be. Well, you know, Larry Steyer, who was also there, they said, well, you know, I think that the Young Artist Program at the Met might be a good place for you, but you would be very young. And so John Moriarty said, absolutely not. You need to go to a graduate program where you're going to be nurtured, where you're going to really learn how to use your voice the way you need to use your voice. And I thought to myself, well, but it's New York, you know, can I at least think about someplace like Juilliard or something like that? He says, no, you're too young. I was only 21 or 22. And so, you know, I trusted him. And he said, I want you to go to Oklahoma City where you're going to work with Inez Silberg, who had been Leona Mitchell's teacher. And I said, but what's in Oklahoma other than tornadoes and cornfields? And he said, a very good school. 
a top-notch school. That's where you need to go. So I trusted him and I went. And when I got there, I was really amazed by the level of what was going on there because I thought, wow, we're out here making really great music. And not on top of Inez Silver being there as my teacher, Flo Birdwell was also there, who was a very strong musical theater teacher. She had taught, you know, Christian Chenoweth and, you know, a few other people who, I mean, that school really produced some top-notch singers in both genres of music. So while I was there, I really, really kind of pulled it together. But, I mean, this is a story that just leads you to where I started my professional career. But while I was there, um, Ed Purrington, who was running the Tulsa Opera, asked me to, uh, to sing the role of Clara in Porgy and Bess. And so I thought, okay, I've never done it before. I've seen it, but I've never done it before. And I would love the opportunity. And, John Moore, and also John Domain was the conductor of the uh, production. So when I got there, it was star studded. It was with Simon Estes and with Bruce Hubbard and with Barbara Conrad and Sarah Reese and, you know, and, and Greg Baker, you know, all these singers I heard about but had never met. And I was a nervous wreck. I thought, oh my goodness. I mean, I'm like the new kid on the block. And they were like, no, you're gonna be fine. And they were so charming and so welcoming, you know, it was great. So John Domain then asked me if I was interested in the Houston Opera Studio program. Well, and I said, well, okay, you know, because again, I didn't know a lot about the program. He said, well, I want you to fly down and I want you to audition. I auditioned, I got into the program and that's where it's all really began for me because that's where I started learning roles and, and understudying and performing. And so it was, I mean, I feel very blessed in my life where my career is concerned. Right. Well, of course, of course, the, the talent is what was uh, lead you there. But I, I know that we always have to have a bit of talent, a bit of luck <laughs> and a, a lot of preparation and be in the right place at the right time. That is always a true for every story I hear about about any career. Right. So okay. but you had to be able to deliver when you are in the right place. Right. So and I'm sure right. yeah, and, and, and you were and you did. So and that's how we all uh, happened. Uh, how was um, how was how long were you in Houston? I was in the Houston Opera Studio for two years. Okay. And, and the thing that was wonderful about the program is then they bring in management to hear you. So I was very fortunate. But I also went on this wonderful what I call journey to opera. In that when I got my first manager, his name was Matthew Lafer. We went on this journey with it of Italy. We took the train and we went to several opera houses from Northern Italy to Sicily so that I could really see what they were doing in that country in regard to performance. It, it was such an education yeah. to see how varying companies worked, you know, in, including Verona, you know, Arena di Verona. And it was it was fantastic. It really was fantastic. That's one of the experiences I'll never forget. Staying in different hotels. You know, I had never been to Europe before at that time. And it was um, eye-opening to hear the, actually hear the language spoken by the people who live in the country. You know, experiencing their hospitality and trying to figure out how to read the signs and read the menus and talk with people because at that time I had no Italian anything so it was it kind of like threw me into the deep end of the pool so it was it was really it was great it was really great so I will never forget that experience the, the, do you think that the, the your managing management did that with all the singers or, or you were a special case because that seems like a, a, a major investment from a company for a management <laughs> to to trust and to be excited about a talent to fly and and travel around with with that person and just to to get you know better uh, your business. That's that was that's fantastic. I don't know if he did that with other people, but I was very happy that he asked me if I wanted to do something like that. And it was at that time I met a very young Marcello Giordani. At that time he was still very young, 
an unknown talent. You know, we when we met him, he was singing for Matthew. He was, you know, it was it was, you know, all of us were kind of just young and unknown and just trying to figure it out. And it was it's that part of the business that was it, it was stressful, exciting. It could be rewarding, disappointing. You know, it's the whole process that goes with it. Mm. Wow, that's that is a, that is a wonderful uh, proposition of the management to really, mm -hmm. uh, really nurture you and 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 help you as much as they can in 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 in, in keeping you ready. That's good for them. And um, so after that, after you go to your management, what was one of the major breaks uh through uh, or, or one of, of one of the most exciting contracts that you have at, early in your career yes and you know i feel like in a lot of ways i've been very fortunate where management is concerned because i i have to say management is everything it really is everything it's very hard to get anything on your own you know in such a competitive pool because it it's not just about and i tell my own students this now your talent is just not enough. It's just not enough. There just has to be other things that push you up to the front of the line, you know? And it's, it could be your, your interpretive power. It could be your ability to move your audience because it's not always about the best voice, right? It's about mm -hmm. the voice that can transfix you, that can take you somewhere while they're on that stage. And a lot of times it's not the most beautiful voice on the stage that can do that. So I think that for me, when Matthew and I went our separate ways, I went with an agent by the name of James Deitch. And that's where I started to experience the German opera houses, which later really became my home sort of base. And, you know, and he, like Matthew, you know, he would come to every opening. He would come to some dress rehearsals. You know, he was there to really just nurture me every step of the way in regard to the German system, which I did not understand. And I was one of those people who I didn't really fit into what you call the Fach. I didn't really fit into one. I was kind of in between Fachs, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I could sing, you know, Ned and Pagliacci, but I could also sing Zalame. You know, I could sing Elisabetta and Don Carlo, but I could also sing Vitalia and La Clemenza di Tito. So it was, you know, they like to have very, you know, the Germans like to be very neat and tidy about how they're, what their singers are going to do. But as an American coming into the German system, you know, and I, I had what they called a glamorous fest in that I wasn't really wed to one house, but I would have several performances in different houses which kept me open to be able to perform in other places. And if I had not had Jim to do that for me, I don't think I would have ever had that experience. And it just really made its roles I would not have been hired for here in the United States, I could do in Germany or I could do in, in Spain or someplace. I mean, it was very, it was wonderful. And even my Spanish agent, he was so great about putting me up for things that, I typically, he said, typically you pro your voice type probably wouldn't do, but let's see if you can do it. And it ended up being a wonderful, what I call journey through repertoire, just seeing what I really could do and really could not do. And so I feel very fortunate in that I had this kind of mixed bag of things that I did that, that set me aside from other singers because I wasn't necessarily a young dramatic soprano. I wasn't necessarily, you know, a, a, a lyrical spinto soprano, but I was just a soprano, just a soprano out there working. And it made for a very joyful experience. Now, was every role successful? Eh, maybe not so much, but it gave me the opportunity to figure that out. Right. And, and um, how do you do... How do you use to manage uh, when you get an offer in terms of dealing with should I do that or should not do it at all? Well, when I, when I got my first AIDA, I actually called Martina Arroyo and I asked her, should I take it? 
she said, if you can sing the Nile scene, you can sing Aida. If you can't sing the Nile, you can't sing Aida. So start there. And that's what I did. So for me, I look at the most difficult part of the role and see if I can manage it where it's situated in the score. So if the hardest part comes an hour and 20 minutes into the opera after I've been singing and I, I'm feeling tired, then I know that that's not going to be a possibility for me. Not at all. Because you need to be as fresh as possible from beginning to end. You know, a tiny bit of fatigue is normal. But to be spent, no. That means mm -hmm. it's not right for you. Not at all. Mm -mm. And you have to be able to do it. I mean, I think one of the biggest lessons for me in terms of how important technique is, is when I did um, Aida with Detroit Opera, okay? Michigan Opera Theater. Mm -hmm. And I was the second cast uh, Aida, and I will leave the first cast soprano nameless because she's deceased now, and she was actually someone I admired very much. But she had health issues, and she wasn't really forthcoming about it. And so... I had three performances. She had three performances. And she, um, every performance, she would have to stop at the intermission. Mm. Every performance. So that meant that they called me at every one of her performances and had me step in. Every performance. And I questioned that because the following night was supposed to be my performance. So it meant that I had to sing from the from the intermission to the end, which means the Nile scene to the tomb scene, and then get myself refreshed enough to sing the entire opera the following evening. And I was actually able to do it. And I think that I really, really thank my voice teachers for that because it technique is everything. It's everything. You can only go as far as your weaknesses will allow you vocally you know so i i really learned that lesson with that right well so so that's that's uh and that that's a, it's a bit of a scary situation because you are already in a major theater doing a major role and say oh let's see if it works <laughs> right exactly and one of the performances was for opera america you know and she was doing that performance i was in my hotel room watching cartoons and eating macaroni and cheese And here they come knocking on my door, Marquita, we need you to come. And I'm like, um, phlegm, macaroni and cheese? I mean, I don't know. And they said, you have to come. She just, she just can't make it through. And so oh. I went. I went, I did it, and I came home. So. <laughs> and rest for the next day. Exactly. That's a, a week of Aida, wow. And um, that's that's exciting though. And and so, um, and what what other uh, roles did you do regularly in Europe? Oh gosh, I got to, I was doing Elizabeth and Don Carlo. Of course I did Liu early on. I did Musetta at Arena di Verona. I sang um, Nedda, the Zeffirelli production at, at Arena di Verona. And it was so funny because when I did the Pagliacci, everybody was, you know, Neil, um, what's his name? Um, the baritone. Um, oh, it slips my mind right now. But everybody was off doing things other places. So I was having rehearsals kind of by myself in a room with tape on the floor. But I didn't realize, because I had not been to the actual Coliseum yet. And so I didn't really understand how huge it was until I acted on the stage, right? Yeah. And I thought to myself, and I was introduced to these people backstage the night of the performance. They were like, uh, hello, yes, I, I'm going to be your, you know, your blah, 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 and your blah, 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 and this is your so-and-so. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. But, you know, really exciting that you're coming in on this big horse-drawn carriage that I never rehearsed on. You know, the arena is, it's absolutely packed with people. And I mean, the adrenaline was pumping, but I thought, well, no guts, no glory. So let's go out here and let's just see what happens. And it was, I just did my own thing. And thank God I had 
seen the production once before, you know, but I had not seen it live. I had seen it, I don't know, in a video recording of some sort, but it was wonderful. It was so much fun, terrifying. I think the adrenaline of the fear is kind of what got me through the whole thing. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. It really was. I mean, I, I can imagine that, of course, it, it's intimidating, but you see that, that sea of people and that amazing mm -hmm. theater stage, uh, and, uh, and then you do your thing, right? But, uh, but it's still, it's, it's a big, big, I, I, I don't know if you call it space. I don't know. It's just <laughs> enormous. I only, I only seen shows. In fact, I saw, I saw Pagliacci there mm -hmm. uh, and it's just big. And yeah. I mean, yeah. It's bigger than a stadium almost. Exactly. Uh, and so how, um, so you just do your thing and, and, and hopefully it all works out. Exactly. You know, I mean, that was one of the productions I did was the Pagliacci, was the Nedda. And I just kept thinking, wow. Because, you know, having seen it, there are all these people on stage, right? And so it's navigating the sea of choristers that I had never met before. You know, navigating the conductor who I had never worked with before. Oh, you know, no! The assistant conductor I had the rehearsals with, not the conductor. And understanding, and he was smiling and conducting, and I thought, okay, wow. You know, and, you know, the Italians are very passionate about their music, as you know. And the orchestra, they were, they were turning around playing their instruments, watching me on the stage, you know, as opposed to completely watching the conductor because I was a new kid in town, you know. And it was so funny because the night before, I had gone to see Dimitrova perform. And I thought to myself, wow. I mean, she's got this big honking voice. And I'm like, are they going to even hear me in here? Because it's so huge. But then I realized if there is this real freaky acoustic thing that happens there. And so everyone can be heard. Everyone. I, it's just the way that play. I don't know if it's all the stone. I don't know if it's, it's the, the way that it's built kind of flat in the middle. And then it goes up with all the seats. But yeah. Everyone's heard. Everyone can be seen. I mean, it's really a thrilling. Once you get past the initial shock of being on stage and how big it is, then it's a thrilling experience. Yeah. You have to prevent yourself from not singing louder than normal. Absolutely. Or you, I don't yeah. just louder than normal. Yeah, you can't push because, you know, one of the basics of technique is that the more you push, the smaller your voice becomes because of all that subglottal pressure. Yeah. Great. Wow. That is fun. That is fun. And uh, <laughs> I know you've been in, in, uh, in other great theaters uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, opera, you've been in Berlin, you've been in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, any other fa fun memory from any of those productions? Uh, any anecdotes that you want to? Well, of Remember? course. Of course, the most challenging of all the Porgy and Best productions was the, the production on the sea stage in Bregenz. That was, wow, that was a tour de force. That no. really was, because there was no intermission. It was run from beginning to end. Um, it was a very physical show. Um, a lot of running. Um, I mean, there were actual singers that, you know, just... I mean, you have to train for that production almost, you know, mm -hmm. um, so that you can sing after you've done all of the running and the jumping and the running up the stairs. And there's the, all that water that's and then at the very end when sport and life goes off to New York with best, you jump in a boat and off you go. You know, it, I mean, it, was, it was one of the most physically challenging performances I had ever done, but and it's memorable. That is traditionally amplified, right? Yes, it is amplified. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, how was, and, and I know that that happens, in, of course, in that theater that is not mm -hmm. a theater. But, uh, but uh, I, in other theaters, and depending on the show, it's often done. Um, do you do, again, any, any difference? Do you sing softer? Do you try it if you can? What, 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 how do you deal with, especially let's, let's talk about Bregenz. How do you deal with the microphone in, in Bregenz? Um. Well, they do have sound engineers 
that, you know, they can kind of turn it up and down. I mean, the thing that I had to think about was not panting from all the running so that it, you don't hear that, <laughs> you know, that's you know, going to just, you know, go all over the theater, you know, the 7,000 people that are there to, and because it sold out every performance, every performance it sold out. So, and I kept thinking, how do I work with my respiration so that when I'm running from one end of the stage to the other, that it still has some sense of reality, right? But yet I don't sound winded. And mm -hmm. so I had to, actually, I had to practice that. I practiced that. I practiced running up because Bragans has a lot of hills, you know, there's the city itself. So I would actually practice running up and down the hills from my, from the street level to my apartment to see if I could get to the top of the hill and then still sing. And it took wow. a little while. It took a little while because I had to really in, in, enhance my lung capacity to be able to do that. So that's, again, I tell my singers, we are singing athletes. And so yeah. we have to take care of ourselves and we need to, you know, we need to train for various productions. Now, another production that was really hard for me, and I'm really glad I only did two, two productions of us was Madam Butterfly. I'm too tall for Madam Butterfly. I'm just too tall. I am. And I feel that the production that we did was very beautiful, but they wanted very um, organic and realistic Japanese movement. And that was really hard for someone five foot nine. Mm -hmm. Really hard. So the music was beautiful. But I mean, again, it's understanding what your strengths and your weaknesses are as a performer. And I really like to play to the drama. And it's very hard to play to the drama when I was very conscious of what my movement was. You know, when we started the rehearsal production, they'd like tied my feet together so I wouldn't take such long strides. So I would take the little short strides that the, the geishas take and that very gentle movement that geishas have. And it was, it was definitely a lesson in control, physical control, but I, it, was, it was hard. It was really hard. And, um, but I'm glad again that I had that experience because again, it made me aware of what my physical limitations are. Yeah. Right. Well, there is, uh, and also it's a very involved role. It's a nonstop. Once you hit the second act, is it's almost nonstop. I mean, it's literally nonstop pretty much for, mm -hmm. for Butterfly, mm -hmm. except a little time on third act. So, um, and, yeah, anyway, but uh, it is it is, it is a challenging role. And, and, and you have done many of those. Uh, so you, you went in Buenos Aires? Uh, yes, from a beautiful city, Tango. I love yeah. watching the Argentinian Tango. It is fun. <laughs> you do Porgy and Bess there with Peter Marks? No, no. It's Vespri Siciliani. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yes. That's with Cheryl? No, I didn't do that one with Cheryl. I actually sang Aida with Cheryl. Where? And in uh, Pittsburgh. And actually, I have to tell you with that... Tito? Yes, with Tito Capobianco. Wow. <laughs> yes. And actually, what was wonderful about doing Aida with Cheryl was he has sung it with almost every legendary soprano. Right. So he could tell me about traditions that I didn't know about. So he, he would say to me, well, you know, Leontine would do blah, blah, blah in this phrase. Martina would do blah, blah, blah in that phrase. And again, it was a real education for me in terms of traditions that I didn't know anything about because I was still a fairly young Aida. And so it was... Um, it was great. It was great working with him on that. And also when I did Aida in um, Mexico City with Pablo Elvira, he, mm. it was funny because the last Aida that they had had there was Maria Callas. And she sang the high E flat at the end right. of the triumphal scene, right? Yeah. So they expected me to sing the high E flat. I was like, You're, I don't have an E flat. That's not a, <laughs> a note that I sport. So long before Zoom, long before all the cell phones, I was calling my voice teacher on the telephone, saying, I've got to figure out how to get an E flat. 
He said an E flat. I said an E flat. So we were on the telephone. I was like, ah, ah, just doing everything, trying to get this E flat. So finally, in one of the last rehearsals, I said to the conductor, I said, Maestro, I don't know. He said, well, you have to try. Just try because the audience is expecting it. So <laughs> that the fine, I thought, well, here it comes. And I just kind of reared back and just did this little squeak at the end. And it was enough to satisfy the audience. It was, <laughs> I just thought, this is crazy. But OK. Oh, oh Lord. Well, uh, going back to to Cheryl, I mean, one thing that that I mean, one of the uh, the main thing that the voice experience is based is and the Cheryl Mills program is to to share the the legend, uh, the 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 tradition and all the all the wonderful history that that comes with with people like Cheryl and 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 yourself and 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 all of us that try to teach the new generations of singers. But one thing that we know for sure with Cheryl is that. He loves to tell stories. Yes. And an amazing thing that he I admire, for, I admire him for many things. And one certainly thing is his memory is incredible to this date. Yes. To this date, I mean, it, it, like last week, just the amount of the stories that he remembers, he remember casts and events and what happened in this performance and that performance that he remember this conductor and sometimes even the players. Uh, it's incredible. So it is fun to to really hang out with him and and hear all about all the stories that that uh, he has. And 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 I'm sure uh, working with him and in Aida, which he had done so much, it's it's a fun, fun, fun um, opportunity. Well, I have to tell you, when I first found out I was going to be doing it with him, I was very intimidated because you know he had been one of the people that I had listened to my entire vocal education long before I started performing, you know, and I kept thinking to myself, wow, am I really ready to sing Aida opposite, I mean, basically a baritone legend, you know, right. was I really ready for, for that kind of work with an iconic singer? And um, one of the things that my agent said to me, Jim, he said, you know, you're never too young or too old to learn, you know, and going in that, and obviously Tito has some confidence in you that he would even cast you with him. He right. said, and therefore it seems that this is an opportunity for you to learn beyond what you've already learned. Now that you've performed it as much as you have, there's still room. And I always believe that there's always more room for character development. There's always more room for carrot for vocal shadings and vocal coloration and and you can do that with all of your roles, no matter how many times you've sung it, if you confidently understand what you're singing about and why you're singing it, you know. And I think with him, it was very interesting. He was very open to the questions, you know, he was very open to to hearing what my thoughts were about the role and the characters. And, and I made it very clear to him, you know, I certainly will defer to whatever it is that you say that I should be doing differently because you certainly have done this much more than I have and with some of the greatest singers of our time. And, you know, and he said, oh no, you know, you, you, you make it be what you want it to be, but, you know, I can certainly give you ideas which I was very, very open to and very grateful for actually. And I have to tell you, he and Maria and I and my boyfriend, we went to football games. We went to the Pittsburgh Steelers football games, ate hot dogs and, and watched the games and laughed and talked. And, you know, it was just a very, mem I mean, for me, one of the cherished moments in Beautiful. my life. Yeah. Great, great. Well, we're looking forward to, to have you in Savannah and hang out. And we'll, we'll hang out again. With <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and I, I will join you guys and, uh, <laughs> and we have a great time there because we always do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And we love Savannah. Savannah certainly uh, lends itself for, for socializing and having fun. So mm -hmm. we'll continue building memories. Um, and how was working with Tito? Well, was that your first time doing a show with Tito? Yes. And actually, I was very surprised when they awarded me 
the artist of the year for my performance there. And I said to myself, well, it, it was, I didn't feel like it was an award that I got just for, for my own, but it was because of the other ideas that came to me while I was there. You know, and I think that it was because, I mean, I took very seriously everything that Cheryl said to me. I took it, I mean, I did not, I was not offended. I was not anything because I felt like I was a student next to him, even though I had been, I had been performing for years, but I still felt like a student next to him. So right. it was, it was great. It was really great. Yeah. Uh, and, and now yourself, you are, you are a teacher now. Yes. Where, uh, where do you, where do you teach? I actually teach at a historically black college at Morgan State University. And I'm really, we have an incredible legacy of singers. As a matter of fact, one of my students just got into the Young Artist Program at the Met. And right. I'm very excited for him. And, but we have several people that are singing there at the Met. Leah Hawkins, Izakaya Savage, you know, um, it's, it, the list goes on and on. And so the school has a rich history of producing really fantastic singers. So I feel very fortunate when it comes to that. And I run the opera workshop there. But one of the things I'm also very excited about is that there was a, a small company in New York that's called Opera Ebony that's been on pause for a few years because the, the person who would really handle the business aspect of it died, Ben Matthews. And um, so now we're trying to revitalize the company. So I've become artistic director of that. So I'm okay. very Excited. Yeah, I'm very excited to see where we can go with the company. What, what is the, the, the vision of the company right now? Well, I think that we're going to start, uh, I guess, a year from now, because we have to do a lot of fundraising, and we just built our board. And I think we're going to try to start with Anthony Davis's Amistad. But, I'm okay. not, but we'll see. We'll see. We just have to wait and see if we can pull it all together. To, um, uh, yeah. African American or Black uh, themes or, or yeah. just traditional yes. repertoire. Yeah, I think that we're going to really try to do as much African American uh, repertoire as okay. we can. I mean, we'll try to intermix some of what I call the standard pieces, but I would like for it to be a house where we really give platform to African American composers or composers that have used African American themes, you know, for something great. For example, Michael Ching. Michael Ching is a part of a, a um, project that I'm doing with Louise Toppin that's called, that's the New Generation Project, where we commission composers to write songs and arrangements of spirituals based on either African-American poets or African-American history. And Michael Ching actually wrote some pieces that were based on slave narratives. So, you know, we're very excited about that, too. So we're Great. trying to do a lot of incorporation type stuff. Good, good. It's, it's, is Louise involved with Opera Ebony or no? Yes, she is. I just oh. actually asked her to be on our board. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we are almost classmates from, from Michigan. So she graduated before I did, but, uh, but I know her very well from, from University of Michigan. So um, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so that's, that's congratulations. That seems to be a very, very fun a project. But but you are not in, in your you're not New York based, right? No, I'm not New York based. So I would have to I need to travel back across. I need well, right I mean my mother is still living and she's elderly and she has some health problems. So I don't feel I can really move from D C until you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. These days, these days uh of of everything is, is remote and online and right. of course we do a lot of life but uh, I personally, I'm, I'm new. I'm, I'm the artistic director of Savannah West Festival, and uh, I work in Tokyo. And uh, and I, I'm also artistic director of a company in Virginia, one in Florida, and I'm also the general director of Opera Hispanica. And I and that's New York based, although we do performances everywhere. And and it's it's pretty much everything we do is is online. Uh, now with the with this, the advantage of Zoom, yes. Uh, it's so convenient, and and you know we are citizens of the world, like yes. like before. So we can, I mean, of course, there's there's a there's a reality that things happen in certain spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I I imagine that Opera Ebony will be similar to what Opera Hispanica is, which is it's a national 
uh, company in a way. <laughs> it may have a, a, a original seat in New York, but I'm sure you guys will do uh, things everywhere, right? Yes, so, exactly. Well, that's what it used to do when it was under the, the management of Ben Matthews and Wayne Saunders. And Wayne is actually still living. He's just elderly now. They, would, they did some collaborations in Europe. So, you know, it is possible to do all of these things. We just need to get it up and running again. And I think that hiatus, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that everything happens in the time it's supposed to. I'm a right. very firm believer of that. And I'm also a firm believer that it's not, it's the tortoise and the hare kind of race. You know, you don't, I, it's better to go the tortoise than the hare because then you have longevity. So right. I want us to build in a way where, the company will have the longevity that it had before. I mean, it was it had been up and going for many, many years until the death of Ben Matthews. So I think that we can do the same thing again, planning, planning properly, putting things together properly. As you know, as an artistic and general manager, it just takes planning and support yep. to make sure that these things happen. Yeah. Yeah, and gathering also the, the support of, of the people and, and your support team. Uh, as many people that will also help you with with all all the many things that had to be done. So, and and like like we with, we do with voice experience, which is uh, the educational component of of the Milns programs. We do also things uh, all all over the, the country. We do a competition that is mostly based in Chicago, and we just did our studio in Iowa, and then we go to Savannah. We do events in New York. Uh, I think you know. It's, it's good to, to move around with these kind of companies that are yeah. not necessarily based on, on one space. Of yeah. course, Savannah Festival is, is, the Savannah, is, is the Savannah Pride and Savannah Opera. Is, we are very much wedded to our city, and that's a different uh, proposition. But, but when you do something that is nationwide, uh, wide, you can do everywhere. One right. question, talking about uh, working with Michael, um, how was learning a new role? It was actually fun you know I don't do a lot of performing anymore so it was you know I love Michael's music right. I really do I mean and I love the fugue at the end it reminded me a little bit of Falstaff you know yeah. but it's it's um yeah it it's I love it and I love the fact that the little Arietta you know it's about this woman and the peas and and the fact that they're tearing down some a place that's very important to her and that she just doesn't really understand why it can't be restored. And, and I mean, I love the, the kind of historical aspect of it all. But it also, to me, is very reality-based because in a lot of major cities now, you find that the governments are tearing down some of the old architectural landmarks to build modern buildings. You know, I mean, I see it happening here in D.C. And I think to myself, wow, I mean, that gorgeous building that, had all the art deco and everything is now gone for a more modernized building. And I think that it's a shame because it changes the whole landscape of the build, the, the whole, you know, what do you call that? The, the whole um, visual aspect of the city, the right. skyline. That's what I tried yeah. to say. Yeah. So I just, you know, I could really kind of relate to it, but I think that Cortina, she's, she's, she's just kind of like your average everyday working person trying to make it right. Right. But with awareness, as you said, with awareness of the social and uh, the importance of your place in the world and, and the importance of, of the culture and the history uh, as part of your of, of what you are, which is in, in a way, Anna Hunter, it's, it's all about that is uh, the opera and the person It's about um, the put into val 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 no, um, value of what we have uh, with awareness of our history because we are building what we are based on what we were. Right. And we need to appreciate it, encourage and and save it. And uh, and so, so. And, and certainly we in opera value history. Absolutely. <laughs> We, we Absolutely. are very aware of our culture and, and the history, and but but certainly also in, in Savannah is very aware of the importance of protecting the history because mm -hmm. we are built on on the on the love and and the 
appreciation for what we what we have and and um so so we're very fortunate to be in savannah and enjoy what people like anna uh had done and and people like like cortina that uh was able to you know to to show us how how important history is for for us uh, because it is what we make us us yeah i mean i kind of i i really fell for her when she says one place in her little aria you know the country farmers market's too far you know i don't have a car i can't afford a taxi cab so i mean what am i going to do when this place is gone so she's basically saying how will i continue to make money how will i continue to live what am i going to do when this place is gone and right. i think that that's what a lot of people even today are saying you know coming out of COVID, people have had to rebuild their lives you know, a lot of people lost their jobs and they're trying to figure out where they go from here. And they've had to go into other type of employment that necessarily they didn't want to do, but had to do just to survive. So I thought yeah. a lot about that when I was looking at the, the, those five pages of music. You know, I was thinking, you know, wow, it, it's very poignant, even, even though this is a Savannah based story, it certainly is a universal story. Yeah. in regard to what people are dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it, it, it touches the I mean, we're lucky that Savannah was preserved, but but the attitude of protecting our history is a is a universal mm -hmm. thing. And and as you it as you know with with working with my police is put in a very fun way, very easy to uh, to enjoy, but also very valuable and, and very touching. So very human well it helps that his that he writes beautiful music exactly that, and the fugue at the end is very interesting the way it's all woven together you know i i found it to be i mean it's it's a little challenging to learn but it's definitely wonderful it's wonderful music it's 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 interesting and quirky and fun it's all of that kind of wrapped up into one all right well, we're very much looking forward to, to meeting you and to have you in Savannah. And also looking forward to your masterclass, which is going to be one of the first events we do on Tuesday. And uh, we're very looking forward to, to working with our, some of our artists and, and to hear you perform the show. So that will be really wonderful to hear you live. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, this is fascinating. It was wonderful to hear about uh, your, your, your wonderful stories and, and your, your history. And I will look forward to meeting you soon, okay? All right. Take care. Thank you. And everyone, thank you so much for joining. And I will see you next week uh, when we talk more voices of the festival. By the way, uh, we start uh, actually tomorrow. Uh, Saturday is our first event. It's a, it's a donor's event. And then the official start of the festival starts Sunday at the Jewish um, GAA. And so join us with the swinging into the season this Sunday and then one event every day, so I will hope to see you in um, live in any of our events, all right? Thank you, and uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you, Marquita. See you. Looking forward to meeting you in person. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.